Okay, and we start recording. Uh, ladies, thank you so much for joining, uh, joining me today in our series of interviews with UK based entrepreneurs. First of all, um, I'm very fascinated uh, by your name situation. So, <laughs> how come uh, two lenses with different spelling came together and started a company? <laughs> oh, good question. Yeah, I think just happy coincidence. Um, so I think to go back to before 5050 came about, um, so I started, um, I think when you, you start find, finding companies and setting them up, you just get a bit addicted to that. <laughs> so th this is kind of a, a bit of a theme that's been happening for us over the past um, eight years or so. So I started um, with a, an accelerator program for tech startups based in Newcastle and it was one of the first ones in the UK. Mm -hmm. And then from that um, we didn't have a co-working space in the northeast or Newcastle at the time. So we then set up a co-working space called Campus North. Oh wow. Lindsay was working for one of our tech startups. Yeah. And um, they hadn't um, managed to get any follow on funding. So uh, Lindsay was looking for work and the director of the company said, oh, well, if you're looking for a manager for your Campus North space, Lindsay would be great. So she came and had an interview with us and we thought that she would be the best person for the job. And so then Lindsay joined. It turned out well. Team. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so then since then, we've also set up, a, we set up another company prior to 50-50 as part of Campus North and that was called Tech for Life. Mm -hmm. And that was looking at diversity in tech and mm -hmm. um, in the skills pipeline in tech as well. Um, so that's how 50-50 came to be really because we're already doing it, but mainly in the tech sector with Tech for Life. And then um, in 2019, we decided to just take it out on, as its own company um, mm -hmm. because we realized there was a lot to do and not just in tech. <laughs> Definitely. So that's that's really interesting. So you have such a big experience already of working together. You went for different projects from different, uh, let's say, situation accelerate accelerations. It's so great. Uh, we have my partner and I, uh, my co-founder and I, we have similar story. Uh, we were studying together uh, in, and doing master program in project management, first in Italy and then in Scotland. And we like we even like moved countries together. <laughs> so, and uh, all the time we've been living together. So apart of being friends, uh -huh, uh, we are flatmates. Uh, we are co-founders of the company. And yeah, I don't know. Um, we've been thinking of getting a puppy together and we will be like, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's it's very fascinating how uh, business can bring people together and um, kind of enrich your life in so many different ways. So oh, yeah, I'm very I'm very glad to hear your story because it's it's so um, I can relate and it's really bring some uh, good memories <laughs> yeah. uh, in terms of 50 50 it's such an important work what you do and could you uh, let us um, know more about the idea behind and uh, what you're looking um, what kind of change you want to make in a uh, current situation yeah i think for us 50 50 um is not about 50 50 bums on seats it's more about that equality of opportunity so um everything that we do really plays on the inclusion part we want mm -hmm. companies individuals um, leadership teams both personally and professionally to really play their own part of being more inclusive so we work with organizations um either in a consultancy type situation or delivering training um, to really help them understand the strategy and what actionable steps that they can take mm -hmm. to try and address inequality in the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I think it's the real emphasis that everyone has a part to play is key. Yeah, definitely. And I think although we are quite um, specifically looking at gender balance because that's our experience, that's our background, yeah. um, we, diversity and inclusion is such 
a huge topic and obviously we can't profess to know everything about it or have experience of, of other areas. Um, but we, what we do try and do is to make sure that we give people the tools and the awareness to apply that across the board. So they just learn to be more inclusive, not just with gender, but to every individual. Yeah. So yeah. we have, um, so we've developed over time our own seven steps to better balance. So that's our methodology mm -hmm. that underpins the way that we work. And it's really about taking that holistic view of a workplace and um, to do everything in your part to try and make the right steps. So for example, it's not, you can't just tackle the recruitment process and say, this is great. We're really inclusive. Our practices, our policies, procedures are spot on. But then if your culture isn't supportive of that or the first impressions or reputation of your company doesn't marry properly, then it's all um, kind of worthless and effort. So mm -hmm. it's about taking that whole view um, and doing things that are gonna really have the most impact okay makes sense so i i'm a complete um beginner in terms of uh, the problem of inclusivity so i know the problem exists i saw myself uh how it exists let's say i was part of uh, a situation where, where i can see the problem in uh, the companies i uh, used to work in um but uh, i never learn how to tackle this problem and you on the other end of this situation so you know how to tackle the problem so what you're saying that it's not about recruiting uh if you're talking about gender equality just 50 50 uh it's about uh deeper changes in the co company culture company structure even uh let's say um what I noticed uh, in uh, one of the companies I used to work back in Russia, because like ladies I'm from Russia originally, um, I work in the very big oil company and uh, we, it seemed like a part of general, like probably there were like 50-50 in terms of how many women uh, would work there and how many men, but the position they used to work, it was like top management uh, in the board of uh, management uh, out of uh, 15 people it, there was just one woman and <laughs> when I heard it when I uh, found out about about that um, first time and it was like 10 years ago I was like how come <laughs> <laughs> I was like seriously um, and I remember we were drinking tea in the kitchen with other colleagues co-workers and I was like one person like it's 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 not how it's supposed to be and uh, some people like well women have different things to do I was like really wow. <laughs> seriously <laughs> yeah. I was like I was so offended back then uh, even like I, I grew up in that culture in Russian culture but even then for me as for women it was extremely like offensive to hear that uh, your place it's probably like um family and stuff and i remember i said uh something like yeah but it's my, my life it's not about like home and marriage and uh the one even lady told me um like answered to me like oh um that's how a woman women who disappointed in their love line say i was like oh Ooh. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. so yeah. it, it was really hostile so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but thanks god it's not um it, it's not like that everywhere but i i completely agree it's uh, so important to bring this understanding of equality and that it's a much more complicated uh, situation yeah. than just recruiting both uh, genders and we are not talking also uh, exclusively about genders it's we're talking about um different um i don't know how to say it uh, right it would be different diversity traits that all kind of yeah. make up unique so our age yeah. or sexuality or education there's so many yeah. factors that play into what makes up a person yeah, yeah and the, i think when we talk about diversity there's obviously the the main underrepresented groups that we're aware of but mm -hmm. then there's so much more than that and because of the intersectionality you know, you're gonna each individual person is gonna have different layers of those things as well. So it really is it's just a lot easier to learn how to be inclusive than focusing on one particular area of diversity. 
Yeah, totally. I, I know that there is a big problem with uh, people with disabilities uh, and how we, um, I don't want to say treated by kind of how many, um, how comfortable they are working uh, at comp and like in big companies, how accessible for them is a different type of jobs. And I know that it's kind of big problem as well, that sometimes companies just show showing that we like we treat, uh, uh, we, we have this inclusive, um, inclusivity, we, like uh, we are a diverse company, but in fact, they, they are not. And it's, um, I, I, I hope that with your with your help, with 50-50 help, uh, we are going this way. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think you're right. You know, there's so many companies out there who say that they're diverse and like to your point before, that diversity in the company might just be all at the bottom of the company or you might get, you know, different departments where you might have, say, for example, the marketing department or customer services usually very stereotypically female, or the tech department's usually very male. So you'll get, although on the whole, the company might look diverse, if you look at the different departments or, you know, up the ladder, it, the diversity tends to lie in different pockets. pockets of the company. And so I've got to be really mindful of that. And I think if you're really authentic about being diverse and being an inclusive company, it really needs to be in your cultural DNA. And a lot of companies think that um, they've got the right intentions and they want to be inclusive and they might think that they are, but the, they really need to have a bit more education around how mm -hmm. to do that and how to tackle some of these issues or what to be aware of. And I think that's where we come in, it's putting that good intention in the right direction. So giving them the right strategies and the right training to help them do it in the best way possible. So. Um, it doesn't just end up being a one-off program yeah. of support and then nothing else happens after that so it just kind of ticks a box totally um what do you see some trends in your clients uh for example do you see that more people more companies trying to solve this problem or um there is no big change how how difficult for you kind of to see trends I think every every company is unique in their position or their stage of where they're at when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Um, in terms of our clients, it's, it's really different. So sometimes companies will approach us because something really unfortunate has happened internally, whether that's um, discrimination cases or sexual harassment, or they they have to be reactive to an issue that's that's arose. Um, other times they are just really invested and they understand that diversity and inclusion is really important. They're not quite sure how best to approach it. So they'll actively seek out and be proactive um, for people that can really give them direction and use that consultancy piece. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just pockets of um, companies might have done a bit of an internal audit. They might have highlighted some areas that they need to work on or that they've identified so they'll approach us to do things like unconscious bias training or particular aspects of, of the delivery that we do. Mm -hmm. um, but the issues tend to be, they manifest in kind of... In all different ways. I yeah. think everybody is very much aware that it should be a priority. Yeah. How much of a priority they actually put it at varies yeah. and how well they do it varies. Um, but I think um, the... The challenges are always the same, but like Lynn says, it's how they manifest within that particular organization. And that's why when we work with companies, we really do work, like give them um, bespoke support because there's not a one size fits all approach. Mm -hmm. We do have standard training packages and things like that, but um, it's really important to us to really understand the needs and how the company structure works and um, what those specific challenges are, how they are manifesting so that we can really make the biggest impact for yeah. them. For example, you have this uh, new client who approached you and uh, how long would it take for you, first of all, to give the consultation in average? I know that each client is unique, but let's say yeah. uh, some, some number and uh, how long would it take for your client to go from um, complete... Um, 
let's say, a blank uh, page of understanding what is uh, diversity and how to tackle this, uh, to being completely diverse and uh, satisfy um, current norm of society. It's, that's a beast to answer. I think it really, um, it does depend. So uh -huh. if it's a global client that has satellite locations all over the place, well, then there's a real big um, fact finding piece in terms mm -hmm. of the consultancy that needs to take place, first of all. So it's speaking with board SLT um, and then speaking to members of staff and colleagues from various locations, pulling that together to get a bit of a picture and draw out some themes and maybe some challenges or, or common issues that are coming up. And then it's putting together um, a plan or a proposal of what's going to have the most impact. Now, that'll always include things that can be done immediately and um, things that are going to take more time and then the long term mm -hmm. in terms of impact diversity and inclusion isn't something that companies can solve overnight or after a couple of training sessions it's really they're in it for the long game mm -hmm. so they will see changes that happen throughout but it's really a journey so mm -hmm. it's going to take years if a company's not diverse and doesn't have for example any women in their senior leadership team it's going to take a long time to nurture that process to do things in the right way so that it has the most impact so it it's it changes if a company's really tiny then you can do that consultancy piece relatively quickly you can get mm -hmm. a plan in place relatively quickly but it's all different it is and i think we would if you really wanted to have an average of just having any kind of impact and being able to see some type of change I would say the first year in that mm. first year um, from you know the the very initial stages and seeing that through to a next follow-up phase I would like to have seen some kind of meaningful impact change, and yeah. change within that time okay ma makes sense makes sense I've, I thought it's supposed to be a long like it's not like a sprint it's a marathon because it's you need to start and you need to continue continue you need to kind of nurture as you say those yeah. uh, women in their company to kind of become um, uh, top leaders uh, in the company um, in, in terms of uh, women uh, men uh, leadership would you say that we need, like as as women, we need different uh, kind of training, a different. We need to nurture different uh, traits uh, to become good leaders. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that that's a common misconception that women are this way and men are this way. But actually, I think men and women have the same traits as humans. We all have you know, the ability to be mm -hmm. empathetic leaders and compassionate leaders. We all have the ability to be assertive and competitive leaders. It's the stereotypes in our society that lead us to think that we behave in a certain way and we end up behaving in those ways. But actually, there's absolutely no reason why men in their leadership roles can't be compassionate and assertive and exactly the same for women to be compassionate and assertive leaders as well. So mm -hmm. I think it's about breaking down those stereotypes. Oh, I love it. I love it. Because <laughs> I, I personally thought that um, there is like women biologically are more, are more nurturing, more like compassion. So we need to kind of uh, push more in terms of being very, you know, firm. But I, I like that uh, you're saying it's a stereotype because I, I don't I don't necessarily want to be that different. I just want to be, um, yeah. I, I, like I don't I I, I think I, I would like to agree with this. <laughs> I don't I don't I like this stereotype. personality. I think yeah. it's a personality thing. Yeah, yeah. And there's definitely traits of being, um, you know, a, a transformational leader, and mm -hmm. I think men and women can both have those traits and or learn um, to have more of those transformational qualities of a leader. Um, yeah, I definitely think it's, it's more to do with personality than it is gender. Mm -hmm. So in terms of um, being, um, we'll go a bit more personal here in terms of your company. Um, so 50-50, when have you been founded? Um, 
beginning of 2019 was mm-hmm. 50, 50 in its current uh, form but we've been in diversity and inclusion for a number of years before that through tech for life yeah so um, uh, how do you see yourself now in terms of what is your current position and what is your aspirations aspirations for the future i think so we've already iterated quite a lot since we first started and especially through um tech for life as well so about four years ago we were very uh, much focused on running women in leadership programs in a di- in the digital sector um and t- I think since then we've realised that actually it needs to be much more inclusive than that. It's not just about um, the women, it's about bringing men into the conversation, it's about the whole organisation getting involved in it. Um, I do think that there was a need for that at the time because organisations weren't running their own programmes of support and it wasn't really on their radar to have that inclusive approach and culture um, to diversity anyway so I think it was fitting for the time but already we've moved on a lot from that so I think our position is definitely um, as an inclusive training and consultancy company so we're not a women's only membership group and we're not a standard diversity and inclusion training provider either um, I think for us it's really about um, holding a company's hand and being that support for them mm-hmm. all the way through the process and at any point in the journey we can work with them through that it's not just a case of delivering and moving on mm, okay so yeah. do, how, how like if if i can ask how do you work with companies so a company comes to you for example and we say we have this incident uh, we want to kind of implement something to avoid this incident in the future um so would it be Pro, like project uh, on project basis uh, or do you have like specific I don't know subspecies? all bespoke so all different depending on the needs of the organizations there's okay. not we don't have a set package so to speak mm-hmm. uh, everything is tweaked and tailored to make sure that we really um, mm-hmm. get to the root of the issues for that company uh-huh. yeah, so, so, sorry initially we would maybe use our seven steps to do a bit of an audit with them so just asking questions around the seven steps to find out more information and from that we can get a better picture of the organization and whether the company goes off and does their own audit based on those seven steps or whether we go in to do that with them Mm -hmm. and then there's usually some training to follow on from that in different phases as well so we expect them to have some training we'll then um give them some um questions and some follow-up work to do themselves Mm -hmm. to keep the conversations going in between the training sessions and then we'll get feedback from them and then we usually um, offer follow-on phases of training or consultancy after that as well so that it just keeps momentum going and then they feel confident that they're doing things in the right way. Makes sense, makes sense. So I see you like consultancy company, well maybe even like more deeper than that because I used to work in consultancy for some time and uh, how we do we just provided uh, like on project basis some some information for example we would train people to do specific things and then we would leave and uh, do not follow up and in terms of you you would you would offer follow-up kind of as trainings yeah. and uh, okay it's it's really good um how many clients uh, what is your capabilities as a company could you like have 10 clients per per month or per year or per week it it depends on the client depends on their needs and it depends on our capacity so there's just the two of us mm-hmm. uh, at the minute and um, because of the work because of the way that we work and it tends to be phased then mm-hmm. we do capacity to have a number of different clients that we can work with simultaneously some of those clients will be on the likes of a retainer basis because we'll have maybe a 12 month plan Mm -hmm. with them other clients might just be one delivery of one workshop on this particular topic so it all kind of up and down and a bit higgledy piggledy Um, I would say any more than 10 in terms of headspace might get interesting (laughs) Um, 
but it's definitely achievable. There's no, there's no issue why we wouldn't work with 10 separate clients in a month. Yeah, it would be a great problem to have. I think if we got <laughs> to a point where we didn't have capacity, yeah. I think we'll just figure out how we, how could. we would do that. So whether that would be bringing in um, associates to help yeah. us mm-hmm. or whether we would be looking to hire um, more staff at that point, then uh, yeah, the, adapt to the more the merrier. Yeah. <laughs> I wish you the the most growth as soon as possible. I think uh, your company is what we need um, in the market and uh, we need to make these changes. So wish you the best luck in this area. Uh, in, uh, I'm going to move us to the second part of the interview. It's very short part and it's short questions. And I would ask you to answer as short as possible because we have two people now. And I, for me, it's personally first time when I interview two people at once. So um, thank you for this uh, beautiful <laughs> experience. Uh, so how are we going to do? I'm going to ask um, both of you I um, know oh I already had I remember these two guys uh, yeah it's been a while so I forgot so um, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you uh, to answer both uh, like each questions both of you okay. so for example Lindsay uh, <laughs> you can choose who gonna go first okay that's fine we'll just one of us will answer first and the other one will follow <laughs> perfect <laughs> Uh, how do you see, uh, remember uh, as short as possible how do you see yourself in five years <laughs> that's a big question for a short answer um, it's not the last one we don't we don't make massive plans into the future it's about being agile and being able to adapt in five years if we're happy and if we're making meaningful change and who knows what that looks like in terms of projects or clients but that would be great for me yeah if we were just in a situation where we were growing and comfortably growing and like Lynn says just looking out for those serendipitous opportunities and yeah. see where we go okay. see where we land good uh, do you have entrepreneurs in your families no no a uh, funny fact, uh, so about 95% of people I interviewed, uh, they have entrepreneurs in the families. So oh. it's it runs in the family usually. And um, if you don't have any, probably if you would dig deeper, you will find like grand, grand great granddad who <laughs> used to <laughs> run a local uh, something. Um, but in fact, um, about 90-95% of people I interviewed, uh, they have someone. And if you don't, it says a lot of, about your like strength and character. So it's really cool. We'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a third question. Um, would you love to travel? And where would you see uh, yourself living in five years? I would like to go on lots of holidays. Okay. <laughs> um, but I think that for now, Newcastle is home. Um, never say never about anywhere else in the future, but for me, Newcastle at the minute is home. Yeah, I do love to travel. Um, but I think, you know, we've both got very young families at yeah. the moment. So I don't think in five years there's probably going to be any grand plans, <laughs> um to, to go elsewhere. But yeah, never say never. Um, you know, I think uh, Sweden for me would be up there or America, but... But not yet. We've got I, a business to run yeah. and family to run. <laughs> <laughs> not, not realistically. I think we'll be staying here. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, what is the most important in life? To be happy, yeah. To be content. Good, good. Um, and that's it. So thank you so much, um, ladies, for the interview. It was completely my pleasure to, uh, to do it. I uh, forgot to ask about your social media. So could you share uh, with our followers uh, how do you connect um, how we can find your company if we're interested to learn more about inclusivity on the workplace and in the companies and uh, what the best way to contact you cool so you can find us um online through our website which is 5050future.co.uk mm-hmm. um, you'll find us on all of the social media platforms or reach out to us directly on linkedin so lindsay horbottle and lindsay Britton lee um, and then contact us 
with DMs, with emails, with phone calls, <laughs> whatever way suits you, we're, we're happy. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. And please uh, stay, keep in touch with our interviews to see more interviews with UK-based entrepreneurs. So I'm going to stop uh, recording. Can I do it? No? Yes. Mm -hmm.